Hey everyone, so the community poll for last week was decided, and it looks like we'll be diving into the Prime Directive. This will at least be a two-part video, possibly a three-part, so stay tuned. If you're curious, basically I see the Prime Directive used in Trek as one of two extremes. It is either considered a law, a pragmatic approach in one of the most important tenets of Starfleet, and we can see examples of this in the original series Deep Space Nine and, yes, even Discovery, or it's a dogmatic religion. It has codified principles that cannot be questioned. We see this exemplified in The Next Generation, most of Voyager, and the genesis of the very ideology in Enterprise. For today, we'll be looking at the pragmatic side. Spoilers, this is the one that I generally lean towards. The Prime Directive, which has also been called Starfleet General Order No. 1, or the Non-Interference Directive, is one of the key hallmarks of the Federation. There are roughly 47 suborders to the Directive. We aren't given all of them, but here are the ones we know so far. In the original series, under General Order No. 1, you may not provide knowledge of other inhabited worlds, even in situations which the species you are interacting with already knows said information. Provide knowledge of technologies or science. Take an action that would support one faction within a society over another. Subvert or avoid the application of a society's law. Further orders are clarified and found in the next generation. Under these, you may not take actions that generally affect a society's development, help a society escape a natural disaster known to the society, even if inaction would result in an extinction event, interfere in the internal affairs of a society. And then Voyager would also add that you may not help a society escape the negative consequences of its own actions. While I feel like I could make a good argument for how both The Next Generation and Voyager were perhaps using their own bias to try and change the Prime Directive into what they wanted it to be, and say something that was never meant to be said or codified, let's assume that each of these suborders are as written, that it wasn't an overzealous Picard or Janeway, but law. Before I get into my argument for it being a pragmatic case-by-case -case law and not dogmatic religion, let's look at where the Prime Directive gets its origins. In the real world, the Prime Directive was almost assuredly a direct response to United States interventionalism. While I would argue, if I still debated these things, which I don't, so don't waste your time in the comments, that the United States has, on the whole, done more good than bad, there are times when the U.S. would put itself in the middle of affairs that were not its concern. And by doing this, it would ultimately turn out worse for the people that the United States was trying to help. We know that while humans and militaries can have good intentions, there are times when stepping in is the wrong thing to do. So it would make sense that when you are a galactic power that sets out to explore new worlds and meet new societies, that you try to codify a law that would attempt to prevent situations in which you only make matters worse. And so the birth of the Prime Directive. Starfleet would only engage with societies in certain circumstances. That is to say, when Starfleet was relatively sure that the species they were interacting with was a high enough technological level that their presence would not be a detriment to the people. This would be generally defined when a society has gained warp drive technology. Even so, the Prime Directive has always had exceptions which were universally accepted regardless of the series you're looking at. Starfleet ships could respond to distress calls by other ships or even planets, and the Prime Directive would not need to be assessed. In certain circumstances where other species have already done actions that would break the Prime Directive, like when the Klingons would arm a certain faction on a planet that didn't have those weapons before, Starfleet could move forward and assist the other faction. If other civilizations attacked a Starfleet ship, that ship could respond, even if the civilization didn't realize what they were doing or that they were attacking aliens. If a civilization was attacking or harming Federation citizens, then Starfleet could come in again, and on and on. So we know that in situations that require split-second decisions, that everyone agrees that the Prime Directive might not apply, or can be set aside. So now we know the suborders, that there are exceptions, and the real-world reasoning for the creation of this law, let's take a look at a couple of the series that treat it pragmatically. They treat it as a law, not as principles or a religion. Namely, let's look at Discovery, the original series, and Deep Space Nine. In the beginning of Discovery, we see the two protagonists who are on a planet with what is clearly a pre-warp civilization. The planet they are on is in the throes of a drought. Without the help of the Federation, the species here will not survive another month. A race that has existed for over a thousand years is about to be wiped out. Now this is in due to a mining accident that occurred, though we can't be sure if it was the Federation or another species that caused it. 
But the dialogue between the two women lead me to believe that even if it wasn't because of another species or because of this accident, the crew of the Shinzu would be assisting regardless. A species that hadn't even hit the industrial age was about to die of dehydration and had been saved by Federation officers. In the original series, there were multiple episodes, even some written by Gene Roddenberry, where we see the crew of the Enterprise break the Prime Directive in order to save people. Sometimes these are egregious infractions, and sometimes they're minor. We even see a debate between Kirk and Spock where Spock calls it logical to break the Prime Directive to save an entire society. Hell, in my opinion, the premise of Deep Space Nine is a walking Prime Directive violation. While it never says, it would seem likely that the Federation put pressure on Cardassia in order to have it withdraw from Bajor, which, if true, would be directly interfering in internal affairs. The Federation moves in to provide support for the Bajorans, who were subjects of the Cardassians and obviously not pro-Cardassian, so taking the side to support one faction over another in a society. The Federation is also there to prevent the Bajorans from going into civil war, so they're helping a society escape the negative consequences of their own actions. Deep Space Nine, a Bajoran station, is fixed and improved with Federation technology, which means they were providing knowledge of technologies and science to the Bajorans. And finally, Sisko would become the Emissary, a religious leader with the ability to turn the entire government to his will, which we see multiple times. Which would be, survey says, subverting or avoiding the application of a society's laws and actions that generally affect a society's development. Hell, I think it's worse than that, because in Deep Space Nine, the series, I see no evidence that the Bajorans had warp technology. They did have space travel, but they were basically using space canoes. Ultimately, I think they would have discovered warp drive, but when the Cardassians came in, they set them back hundreds of years. Anytime we see a Bajoran using a warp-capable vessel, it would appear that that is either a Federation vessel or one from Cardassia. In fact, when the Romulans wanted to put military assets on a Bajoran moon, the best the Bajorans could come up with was ships that had impulse power. Not exactly intimidating. But here's the kicker. All of these violations are generally exceptions and not the rule. They have justification. They have reason. These violations are okay because people look at the law pragmatically and not dogmatically. And what I also love is that we see in the shows both the positives and negatives of doing these actions. The impacts aren't necessarily looked at as good, but necessary. And they are justified in the end, unlike what we see with TNG, Voyager, and Enterprise. If nine times out of 10, it is a bad idea to get involved, then by definition, one time out of 10, it's good. When pragmatically applied, like we see in the series, the Prime Directive is a great idea. It doesn't mean that Starfleet will always get it right, perhaps getting involved when Starfleet shouldn't have, but it does mean that they're trying to do the most good, unlike the dogmatic and religious view of the Prime Directive, which we will take a look at next week. Stay tuned, guys, as we break down the Prime Directive once more. And trust me, if I have irritated you with my views here, you haven't seen nothing yet. I'll catch you on the next Lore Reloaded.